The boy in the box was naked. He'd recently had a bath, his hair was freshly cut, and a thin blanket was wrapped around his little body. It could have been a gesture of love, but considering that he'd been beaten to death, leaving a blanket behind seemed strange, almost sinister. He was found in northeast Philadelphia, but whether he lived in the area was a mystery. So was his name. His makeshift coffin didn't offer much in the way of clues. The cardboard box had once held a bassinet from J.C. Penney, but by the winter of 1957, it contained something much more valuable. At roughly 30 pounds, 3 feet, 3 inches, the boy might have been as young as 3 or 4, or a malnourished 6. It was hard to say. But the question of what happened to him sparked widespread speculation throughout America. Some believe he was killed by his caretakers, while others think he was targeted by a stranger. No matter who was responsible for his murder, it remains one of the most chilling unsolved crimes in American history. Let's get into it. Hi, I'm Chris. Thanks for watching True Crime Recaps. Like everything else in this case, the investigation got off to a strange start. The boy was left like garbage in a vacant lot that was used as a convenient dumping ground for old appliances and other unwanted things. He might have been killed three days or two weeks before he was found. The cold weather made it hard to tell, but in the last week of February 1957, a teenager who lived nearby was the first to spot him. But he couldn't risk being caught trapping muskrats illegally, so he said nothing and left the boy where he found him. The second man to notice the body was a peeping Tom, and he didn't want to get involved either. He may very well have been on his way to sneak a peek at the girls in the Good Shepherd Catholic halfway house nearby. And you can bet he didn't want to be a witness to a crime. And he didn't want to know who did it. He just wanted to forget he ever saw the body. So he left. But it wasn't as easy to put it out of his mind as he thought it would be. The next day, he told his priest about it, and then he went to the police, and that's how America first met this unknown child. The boy was lying on his back, and someone had folded his arms across his stomach. He had blue eyes and light brown hair cut short, almost down to his scalp. There were little clumps of hair clinging to his skin, which means his hair had been cut just before or just after he died and while he was naked which means it must have been important to change his appearance, but why? And the haircut was just one of the clues his body had to offer. Bruises on his forehead look like they could have been made by an adult holding him aggressively while his hair was cut. And that's just the start of his shocking injuries. His head, torso, and legs were covered with bruises from the beating that most likely killed him. There was a good-sized L-shaped scar on his chin. He had a scar on his left ankle, which could have been a remnant from a transfusion or some other surgery. Three other surgical scars were found on his torso. The longest one was on the left side of his chest. And there was a roundish scar on his left elbow. There was another scar on his private parts, and he was circumcised. That's important because circumcision in America didn't go mainstream until the 1970s, according to circumcisiondebate.org which is a source I never thought I'd have to cite, but you never know where a clue will come from, do you? And his circumcision may be important to finally solving this case. But it's far from the only clue about the way he was cared for. His finger and toenails had been clipped, and his right palm and the bottom of his feet were wrinkled like he'd been soaking in water just before he died. His prints were sent around to hundreds of hospitals in the area to try to get a match with birth records, but nothing ever clicked. They also found one other important thing on his body, or actually in his eye. It looked like someone had treated some kind of medical issue in his left eye with drops, but when and why is unclear. We do know a few things about the box and the blanket wrapped around him. J.C. Penney sold 12 of those bassinets the box originally contained. Now, somehow, 11 of those were accounted for. So, did the killer buy the 12th bassinet? Unfortunately, there's no way to know because according to americasunknownchild.net, pennies had a cash-only policy back then, and no usable fingerprints could be lifted from the box. As for the flannel blanket around him, it was like thousands sold across the country, but it was well used and thin. 
Someone had mended it with a sewing machine a few times, which made it all the more baffling to see it was cut in half. Both sides of it were in the box, but a small piece of one half was missing. As strange as that was, one of the biggest clues might be something found less than 20 feet away, at the end of a path from the box through the brush. It was a man's hat, which you might call a newsboy cap, blue corduroy with a buckled leather strap at the back. It was traced back to the manufacturer, a small hat shop based in Philadelphia. They'd only made about a dozen of those caps, but that one was special because of the leather strap. That was a special request. And in the designer's opinion, the customer looked a lot like the boy in the box. He was alone when he came into her shop, and he was wearing what she called working clothes. Could this man have been the boy's father? It was difficult to tell. He was in his early 30s or late 20s with light-colored hair, and he didn't speak with an accent. Which brings us to our first person of interest, the roofer, Charles Spies. Investigators worked this case hard from the start. They tracked down more than 400 registered foster children to make sure they were all alive and well. They poured over thousands of pediatric hospital records trying to connect the boy's scars with surgeries. And they handed out his picture all over the city hoping someone would recognize him. A few people thought they did. They insisted his name was Terry Spies, and his father had been a handyman and roofer before they both disappeared from a boarding house in Camden, New Jersey, just two days before the boy's body was discovered. By March 11, 1957, this was the hottest lead going. It was picked by all the papers, and police alerted more than a dozen states to be on the lookout for him. The missing boy's mother came to the morgue to see the body. Now, this could have been the break in the case they were hoping for, but it wasn't. She hadn't seen her son, Terry, for a year, but she didn't think this boy was him. But here's the thing. The boy people had seen with Charles wasn't necessarily her son, meaning that just because the boy in the morgue wasn't her son, it didn't mean Charles was off the hook. And the man was still missing despite all the media attention. It seemed like the case was solved right up until the point when Charles and his son, Terry, were found alive and well about 30 minutes outside of Philadelphia. And that's how it went over and over. A tip would come in about a missing neighbor, kid, a strange man, a bus, a kidnapping victim from another state, a family of farmers with the same kind of blanket, a young Hungarian refugee, and on and on and on and on. Nothing ever checked out. But two theories did emerge that couldn't be completely disproved. What do you make of these? Theory number one, death at his foster home. This one has been a favorite since the beginning, but it gets off to a strange start, so bear with me. One of the medical examiners on the case was so moved by the boy's tragic end that he spent countless hours of his own time trying to solve it. About three years later, he got a tip from a psychic in New York who said the boy was killed at a foster home in the area, and she described the specifics of the building and he went looking. When he finally found it, he was rewarded with a shocking sight. Hanging on the clothesline were the same kind of blankets the body was wrapped in. And hold on to your hat. Here's the most stunning detail. The blankets had been cut in half to fit the size of the cots the kid slept on. Which explains why he was wrapped in two halves of a blanket. And there was a small pond on the property which might have accounted for the boy's puckered fingers and feet. You can imagine how the police reacted. The working theory was that he was either a foster kid or the biological son of the oldest daughter and she either snapped and killed him or he died accidentally and they ditched his body to avoid an investigation. At the time, they had eight foster kids and they were all accounted for. But here's the strange thing. The daughter admitted she had a son who died in 1955, but he wasn't murdered. He was killed in a freak accident on one of those mechanical horses at a department store. As bizarre as it sounds, her story checked out, and with nothing solid to prove their involvement, they had to let it go. Officially. But, unofficially, the M.E. kept digging. The family moved away the following year and held an estate sale, which he went to. That's when he saw the bassinet. It was just like the one sold in the box. They chased a few leads hoping to corroborate their theory, but like everything else in this mystery, they only found dead ends. Finally, in 1998, they tracked the family down to try questioning them one more time. And by that time, the mother had died and the father had married his stepdaughter. The woman they thought might have given birth to the boy. How's that for a twist? 
The new couple answered all their questions, and they walked away with no new evidence. Shortly after that, the man of the house died, and his stepdaughter slash wife was put in a nursing home, and that's where the investigation ended. Although for years, other people have insisted the family was responsible. The second favorite theory developed more than 40 years after the boy was found. And if there's any truth to it, it's absolutely horrifying. So buckle up. By 2002, this case had been featured on America's Most Wanted and in hundreds of true crime shows and articles around the world. But all the tips and leads they generated went nowhere. Then, in June of that year, the detective got a call from a psychiatrist in Cleveland. One of her longtime patients was obsessed with the boy in the box, and she claimed her mother was the killer. This woman spun a story that will chill you to the bone. In 1995, she said her mother bought a little boy who she called Jonathan. This woman would have been around 11 years old at the time, and she claimed Jonathan was there to be used and abused by her mother in every sick way you can imagine. He was kept in a refrigerator box in their basement for two years until she finally killed him for throwing up in the bathtub. They took his body to the vacant lot on the other side of town and left him in the box they found there. Now, here's the thing. Her therapist said she'd been telling this story in sessions since 1989, and it matched other pieces of evidence they hadn't released to the public yet. The claim that he threw up, for example. A brown substance was found in his throat. It was baked beans, the same meal this woman claimed he ate before he died. And then there's the fact that his hands and feet were wrinkled like he'd been in water. The bathtub would explain that. And those aren't the only details that made a few random clues fit together. There's also an eyewitness account. Not long after the body was found, a man called the tip line to say he saw two people, a woman and a boy, standing at the open trunk of their car near that spot only two days before the boy was spotted. He slowed down to see if they were having car trouble and needed help, but they turned their backs to him and didn't say a word, so he kept going. He thought it was weird at the time, but after the boy was found, he figured it was downright suspicious. He had no idea how suspicious it might have been, because the woman told the police the same exact story. She said a man passed by in a car while they were taking the body out of the trunk, and she and her mother refused to turn around and blocked the license plate and the trunk with their bodies. Exactly the way he remembered it. Except, of course, he thought he was looking at a woman and a boy, not a girl. You can see why this was the most exciting development in decades, but... They had to prove it, and in the end, they couldn't. They searched the basement of the house where this woman used to live in Philadelphia. The house she claimed was the boy's prison for two years. But they found no forensic evidence to back up her claims. They also interviewed friends and neighbors who had been in and out of the house at the time, and none of them had seen anything remotely resembling that scenario. So, as I said, they couldn't prove it, but they couldn't completely rule it out either. Unfortunately, today, they still don't have much to go on. The boy was buried in a pine box in a pauper's grave, but the investigators pulled their money together to get him a headstone. It read, Heavenly Father, bless this unknown boy. And back then, none of them had any idea that DNA technology would evolve as far as it has, and his body and the evidence wasn't preserved the way you would have hoped. But eventually, they managed to extract mitochondrial DNA from his teeth. That's good news, but not great news. You see, mitochondrial DNA can only be traced through his mother's family line, and of course, they would need to find people to test against. And this isn't the kind of DNA that can be uploaded to an ancestry site, but it's still something useful, and it means there's a better chance than ever that we might someday know his name. Today, he rests in a new grave in the Ivy Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia. Visitors leave stuffed animals and flowers for him all the time. And for now, the name on his headstone is America's Unknown Child. And the story of his life and death is still a mystery. And that's your recap. But don't go away. There's another great recap coming up right now. And Amy and I are here three times a week with new stories, so remember to subscribe and hit the bell so you never miss a mystery. Until next time, take care. <laughs>